But as we discuss this stimulus package, a lot of people are wondering uh, whether it's enough when we look back at prior uh, turmoil in the financial markets, uh, a lot of people comparing it back to the Great Recession we saw back in 2008. Our next guest is a man who knows that all too well. Uh, it's a, a professor at Harvard of Economics right now, professor of economics at Harvard, uh, who served under Obama as his former Council of Economic Advisors chair. Uh, and I want to bring him in now to assess this. Jason Furman uh, joins us on the Google Hangout. Uh, and Professor, when we look at this, um, I'm just curious to get your take because we just heard the details from Jess about what this bill will entail. You, you laid out four buckets that would really matter here in terms of uh, addressing the health side concerns and staffing hospitals, uh, as well as uh, unemployment insurance for a lot of Americans. Those who aren't working would need to get the stimulus checks that you had talked about as early as March 5th. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, politicians come on board with that idea, as well as loans for businesses out there. So in your estimation, uh, as well as having experienced something like this back in 2008, what do you grade uh, what we're seeing out of D.C. and how do you think that it will help uh, prevent uh, a an economic collapse here? So um, thanks for having me on your show. I think this is the biggest, fastest thing I've ever seen Congress do. And I'm still not sure if it's enough. Um, I think it's, 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 you know, so in some sense, I grade them like an A for how quickly and rapidly they got here and how big it is. Um, to some degree, you know, it may be up against problem that's even bigger and faster um, than anything in this, um, in this legislation. Yeah, I mean, when you were laying this out, you, you had originally called back on March 5th for about a $350 billion stimulus package, as well as sending $1,000 checks to Americans. Uh, now it's ballooned to $2 trillion, and you're still saying that might not be enough. Why? Yeah, I mean, this is all moving so quickly. Um, you know, I came out early with a stimulus plan. That was before we'd seen the national, the lockdowns in states across the countries, before we'd seen the global ramifications. I mean, just to have some perspective on how all this is growing, nine days ago, the main lobbying group for hospitals, doctors, and nurses requested that the stimulus include $1 billion for hospitals. It was like an Austin Powers moment, $1 billion. <laughs> the legislation gives them $130 billion. When in the world do you see a lobbying group get 130 times more than what it asked for? It's when the problem is growing exponentially and by the day. Uh, I know that you also had highlighted the fact that we were moving so quickly here. And I, I guess the fact that they are getting 130 times what they were originally requesting is that uh, politicians are slowly realizing how big of an issue this could become. We're going to get unemployment uh, jobless claims tomorrow. Uh, we've been hearing estimates that that number could be as high as 3 million. Back in 2008, we didn't see anything cross 700,000 for weekly jobless claims. So I guess that speaks to uh, how quickly this is deteriorating here. Uh, but in regards to that $1,000 check, I mean, what's your take on that? For some Americans, they're going to be getting that, uh, depending on how much they made back in 2018. Is that enough as well? Yeah, I think what you want here is a belt and suspenders uh, type of approach. You do a lot of things at once. Unemployment insurance is really critical for people that lose their jobs. There's a number of people that see income reduction and face problems that don't get that unemployment insurance. So a blanket check to everyone can provide a bit of a baseline. By itself, is, is it enough? No, um, but it's better than nothing. Then you want to keep businesses going to the degree possible. Um, for small businesses, you probably need some actual effectively grants, and that's what this legislation has. For big businesses, I'd much rather see it in the form of loans, the government having a shot at getting repaid, having some of the upside if those businesses succeed, and making sure the costs are being shared um, with their shareholders and others. So there's a lot of different pieces to, in this for individuals and businesses. Anyone who tells you there's one magic bullet, here's our one solution, just doesn't understand how the government functions, doesn't understand the uncertainty we're operating in. You know, all of these channels will take different amounts of time, reach different people. I'd rather, you know, use too many different tools than, than, than too few. Hey, Jason, it's Brian Chung here. So I cover the Federal Reserve for Yahoo Finance, and I was on a call earlier this morning with uh, James Bullard from the St. Louis Fed. He was saying that the impact to the second quarter would be unparalleled compared to U.S. macroeconomic history. He said we shouldn't be discouraged, though, because it, we could still bounce back and have a transitory period if the health response is correct 
in the third quarter. Now, I guess the question here is, how will you see monetary policy working with fiscal policy here? There was an unprecedented move where you had a Federal Reserve announcing Monday that it would like to have a Main Street lending facility, but didn't actually announce the details because it was maybe subtly nudging at Congress to say, can you give us the authority to do this? Where do you see monetary policy and the Fed aligning with what Congress is trying to work on right now uh, as this bill kind of comes into fruition? Yeah. So um, those are essentially two questions. So the first one, the second quarter GDP growth is going to be terrible. And it's going to be terrible because the government wanted it to be terrible. The government wanted it to be terrible to stop the virus. We stopped economic activity to stop the virus. That's a good thing. We needed to do that for our health. We needed to do that for our economy. Nothing in this legislation will change that. What this legislation will hopefully help to do is mean when we get to the other end that consumers have better balance sheets, that more businesses are intact, that the financial system is intact, and you need all three of those to have the so-called V-shaped recovery where you quickly snap back. I myself am a little bit worried about our ability to have V-shaped recoveries. There's a lot of dynamics in the economy that are effectively asymmetric. It's easier to go down than to go up. It's easier for the unemployment rate to rise than to fall. It's easier to go bankrupt than to start a new business. Um, and all of that creates asymmetries in the economy. So I'm you know, not that bullish on a V-shaped recovery, but I think we should be doing everything we can um, to position ourselves better for the eventual recovery. And I interpret a lot of this legislation as that. Yeah, and when we look at it too, I mean, a lot's been made about the states dealing with all this too, and how that's kind of uh, shifting away from what we're hearing out of the White House too, as President Trump shoots for an Easter timeline to get all these businesses back open. Uh, we heard from Governor Andrew Cuomo speaking a little bit ago, saying that the $3.8 billion that this Senate bill would give the state of New York was just a drop in the bucket uh, saying that the, the state's revenue shortfall is still going to be nine, 10, maybe $15 billion there. Uh, when you look back at what happened uh, in your time serving under Obama and the way that you tried to get the, your own bill passed in 2009 to get the Recovery Act uh, put through, I mean, is there a concern that states won't have the funding necessary to kind of help bring back the economy when we hit the Q3? Yeah. One of the reasons for the slow recovery after the financial crisis in 2007 through nine was that even as the federal government was expanding spending, states and localities were cutting back on their spending. And so you had a fiscal contraction at the state level that probably took about half a point off of annual GDP growth for several years um, into that expansion. That's something from a macroeconomic perspective we want to avoid now. This legislation is very good in providing money that the states need for COVID related costs, not enough for New York, but enough for most states. What it doesn't do, though, is replace all the revenue they're going to lose because of the recession. And when they lose revenue, they have balanced budget requirements under their balanced budget requirements. They'll need to cut spending on teaching and on um, you know, police and parks and anything else that they do in their states. And so that was a big, big, that is a big, big missing piece in this legislation. There's definitely going to be stimulus four. It's gonna extend some of what's in stimulus three. It's gonna expand some of what's in stimulus three and states need to be high up on the list, um, stimulus four. Hey, Jason. Uh, so just to follow up, it sounded like you were yeah. about to hop on that thought about the Fed and, and monetary policy. $454 billion is the proposal which the Fed could lever up supposedly the $4 trillion. Uh, for that Main Street business lending facility, what do you think that would look like? How would that help? Yeah. So the, the thing to understand about the Fed is the Fed does not like to take risks. The Fed does not like to invest in a failing company and lose its money. When the Fed does, you know, you normally see these headlines with, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions, what the Fed is doing in those cases is it's lending against collateral. What this bill does is it gives the Fed a bunch of capital, over $400 billion of it, that it can now take much greater risks with than it would normally be willing to do. That money can go into a facility, the Fed can put its money into a facility. Hopefully that facility will you know, lend money to businesses, help the economy get fully repaid, and there won't be a dime lost. But 
they need to take some risks in order to protect our economy. And the fact that they now have a cushion that was authorized by Congress that will be signed into law by the president is essentially fiscal policy saying we are willing to lose money in order to conduct this rescue, I think will give the Fed a lot more flexibility to take the types of risks and chances that this economy um, needs right now. And so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about you know, the benefits of that and, and the importance of that in this yeah, legislation. I mean, tying it back down to what we saw in the financial crisis, a lot of that, we're seeing a lot of similarities. One of them too, I think to use that example there, uh, specifically looking at the airline industries right now, this, uh, this bill will allocate about $25 billion in strings attached grants to passenger carriers and three billion to airline contractors. When you look at caterers uh, and other people working there, uh, the question had been uh, whether or not the government would take equity stakes in some of these companies, uh, and also allocating some bailout money here to Boeing as well. Though it's not saying all of the funds will be going to Boeing. But when you look at that, how do you kind of uh, weigh, you know, the government picking winners and losers here, choosing who to invest in? Uh, since that was something that you know a lot of people got mad about back in the financial crisis when you think about too big to fail. Uh, and how do you think it might impact other options out there in terms of supporting the workers that are trying to get paid here uh, and some of these unions, particularly in the airline industry, maybe use that as an example? Yeah. So the legislation gives a lot of discretion to the administration about how to use these funds with airlines and the like. What I would like to see is that the funds are used to deal with the very intense liquidity crunch that these companies are facing and to help them continue on their operations. They should not bail out their shareholders. I think their debt holders should also be bearing um, some of the costs. When you lend money, you're taking a risk. You get a higher interest rate, but sometimes, um, sometimes you lose out. This will be one of those, should be one of the cases. And, you know, as much as possible, the taxpayers should be um, repaid. On Jim and Chrysler, we did $80 billion in the Bush and Obama administrations. We got about $70 billion back. I think that was a good deal for taxpayers. You know, it ended up having a net cost, but that net cost was small compared to the total amount of support. And I think small compared to the you know million plus jobs that were saved, all the additional costs we would have had in unemployment insurance, Medicaid, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, the goal here is business continuity, protect the taxpayers' investment to the degree possible. You know, if we lose 10% of our money on these bailouts, um, but these companies continue and jobs are preserved, um, and one real, I think that one would one be fine. Quick, one real quick question on that too, just to follow up here before we let you go. You had also raised uh, inflation worries. A lot of people always, anytime you hear a two trillion dollar price tag out there, might get worried about runaway inflation. You don't seem to have that fear though, based on the economic environment that we're in right now uh, and the way that real interest rates uh, are negative. You could give someone a thousand dollars that wouldn't be necessarily anything uh, nine hundred dollars down the line. So, what are your thoughts there, real quick, before we go? Yeah, um, you know, there's an unprecedented amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus. Sometimes one would worry about inflation. Right now, the financial markets are projecting an inflation rate of about 1% over the next decade. I think they're right because in an economy that's depressed like ours, it's very hard to get inflation. Um, there's a chance they're wrong, though. Everything is so weird right now. Who knows? Um, but you know what? I wouldn't fear inflation right now. In fact, I would welcome inflation right now. I think it would help oil a number of the, re number of the wheels in our economy and actually help our, our economic performance. But that being said, I don't think we'll get it. All right, there you go. The grade from uh, one of the leading thinkers, leading economists in the United States, Jason Furman there, giving it an A so far. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate you joining us and hope to have you back again soon. Thanks for having me. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.